Well, good evening. It's a blessing to be back with all of you again, and been looking forward to our time together. And tonight we're going to start to dig in uh, more deeply into the New Testament picture and concept of worship. Uh, we will be jumping back uh, into the Old Testament in the coming weeks, but tonight we're going to focus really fully on that. And before we do that, I'm going to uh, bring up another screen here and just very quickly review uh, things we've talked about in the past couple weeks. So first a quick review about the basic ideas about worship. And uh, I'm sure you remember, we've talked about the fact that worship is three things in general, action, attitude, and affection. And when we speak of action, we're speaking primarily of the idea of giving, giving something to the object of our worship. Uh, and as we look in the Old Testament, we see many uh, different kinds of things that can be given. Uh, ultimately, uh, we could say that all of the giving boils down to two things. One would be the heart, giving God our heart. Isaiah talks about this and the fact that the religious leaders of his day and the Jews of his day were not giving God their heart, even when they were doing all of the outward ceremonial worship, they still were left wanting. The Lord Jesus, quoting Isaiah, talks about that in connection with the religious leaders of his day. And he says, look, you do all of the outward things, you observe the law, but you're not really worshiping me because you're not ultimately giving me your heart. And so when we think about worship as the act of giving, it's primarily about giving God our heart. That does not mean that the outward things are not important. In fact, those outward things can often be an evidence of us truly giving our heart to the Lord. At the same time, it is possible, we know from the scriptures, to sometimes do the outward and not actually give God ultimately what he wants. The other aspect of giving in worship that we find really at, at the base level of all of Christian worship is giving God glory. And psalm writers often word it this way, giving God the glory that's due unto his name. Or we could say, very simply, giving God the glory that he deserves. And so when we think about worship in general, these are the two things. And these are going to uh, play a big part in what we look at this evening, especially this idea of giving God the glory he deserves. But it's important to remember that it's not possible for us to give God the glory he deserves if we are not giving him our heart. Secondly, we talked about the fact that worship is an attitude. It is a right view of God and a right view of myself and my relationship to him. And whenever we have that right perspective, which we can only ultimately get from God's word, it will stir up in us a heart of humility, uh, an attitude of humility, uh, as well as awe and reverence for our God. So attitude, which is driven by truth, really. And then thirdly, affection, which relates to our love for God. And all of these are a part of what we do in worship. And then a couple other reminders from these uh, past weeks. Worship is not an experience to be had. If we view worship that way, it's going to lead us astray. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Worship is focused on the object of our worship. It doesn't mean that we aren't thinking about ourselves at all. It does not mean that worship uh, does not impact us or benefit us, but 
the purpose of worship is not that benefit. The purpose of worship is not us. If it is, we become the object of worship. And I did mention last week, we do benefit from worship uh, when we are worshiping God correctly. And we talked about the idea of reciprocity. Beautiful thing in God's word that we see repeated over and over again. When we obey God, when we give him what he deserves, we always benefit. Now, our ultimate motivation is not that benefit, but there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that benefit at the same time and appreciating it and looking forward to it. Lastly, we emphasized last week the fact that we are to worship God, as we read in the very first commandment, and we know this from reading the scriptures uh, from cover to cover, God is to be the object of our worship. But what we realized last week, sorry for the little interruptions there, what we realized last week is that we are prone to wander. Uh, the hymn writer said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Sadly, the man who wrote those words in his later years did turn away from the Lord, almost to the point that one wonders if he was ever truly saved. But we are prone to wonder. We saw that in the book of Exodus, the book of Deuteronomy, emphasized very clearly God's people can worship God, but be tempted towards worshiping something else. And what we often see in the scriptures and in our own experience is that we end up worshiping ourselves in a way and loving ourselves basically in a way that only God deserves. So that's a quick uh, review of things we talked about last week. If you've got any questions about those items, we'll have some time again at the end tonight for uh, some questions. Or if you want to raise your hand, uh, Brother Jacob uh, uh, is acting as a co-host and if he sees you raise your hand or hit the hand waving button, you're welcome to interrupt me at any time. Uh, just unmute and ask a question or we can do them at the end. Tonight we're going to go into a New Testament perspective on worship. And one of the things that we're gonna find as we go through this uh, rather quickly tonight is that the picture of worship in the New Testament, or let me say it this way, the focus of worship, not the object of our worship, that never changes, but the focus, the way in which we worship, which is rooted in the Old Testament, and it is found there, but it's highlighted in the New Testament in a very particular way, a very direct way, and it, go, it touches on the point I made, I think, last week, maybe two weeks ago, that we don't find many direct references to worship in the epistles or the book of Acts, the way we find it so often in the Old Testament. But we're gonna to see tonight, I hope, what worship is in the New Testament or how it's to be done. We already know what it is, but how does it manifest itself? How are we to do and be the three things we talked about. How are we to give God glory and our hearts? How are we to think of him and ourselves? And how are we to express our love? So as we get into that, I want to uh, turn your attention to a handout that was circulated by Brother Jacob. And before we get directly into uh, the issue I was just describing, there's a couple things that I do want to um, uh, emphasize uh, for us to keep in the back of our minds. And you'll see this in your handouts as well. Theology ultimately drives what we do. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Theology drives. Sorry, I'm doing weird things here. Let me just get to the play button. There we go. Okay. Uh, 
what we believe leads to what we do. It goes both ways. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But what we do reinforces also what we believe. In other words, we make decisions about what we do based upon what we believe. At the same time, what we do reinforces what we believe. And I'm speaking right now about our public um, church worship. If we start out with a right theology about worship or about anything else, and then we wisely apply that theology to life and to ministry, this wonderful cycle is created. We think right, then because of what we think we do, and hopefully we are doing right, which then reinforces that thinking and allows us to go even further. You could think about it as a, a, a dot, and that dot being the right theology about worship or about anything else. And then as you start with that theology, and then you draw a line circling out. In fact, let me just uh, kind of demonstrate that this way. We could think about theology as this dot, or write a correct theology, which leads to actions, thoughts, actions, words, etc. And then what that does is that reinforces that theology, which spawns further action, which reinforces that theology, which spawns even further action, which continues to reinforce. And we have this wonderful cycle, which ultimately we hope is drawing all of our being into greater uh, conformity with God's word. However, it is possible for the opposite to happen. If we start out with the wrong theology, then we may end up with a life and a ministry that leads us further astray. Think of those concentric circles kind of working backwards. Sometimes the cycle gets interrupted. We may have a solid biblical theology, but we might adopt practices that come from a different theology. And we tend to think that what we do is neutral. As long as what we say is right, as long as what we say we believe is right, then, then what we do or our actions uh, are, are really kind of neutral and not really uh, a part of what's going on. I, I would uh, draw it kind of like this. If I have this particular theology that is true and biblical, but I have an action that is coming from some other theology. So I'm gonna call this one right and this one wrong. I'm being a little bit simplistic about it, but I think you understand. So we've got this right theology signified here, and then we've got actions coming from a different theological foundation, but we are attempting to adopt that. Well, instead of our theology being reinforced, actually, we're being led astray by our actions. Right theology can and should lead to right actions, but wrong actions or actions coming from a different theological foundation will interrupt that flow and will lead us into uh, ultimately a different kind of theology. Because if my actions are coming from this theology, if I'm here, but I am acting based upon this theology, eventually it's going to pull me into that orbit. And if that theology really is unbiblical, then I am being led astray both in what I believe and in what I do.
This is a not uncommon occurrence uh, in churches. If we continuously use methods that have not been derived from our theology, over time our theology will slowly drift, even though the preaching or the stated theology of our church has not changed. I could tell you many stories about this for the sake of time, I won't, but I could tell you of uh, churches that were sound in what they preached, they were sound in their doctrinal statements, but at some point they adopted practices that were based on a theology different from what their church held to. And it ultimately led those churches in directions that were counter to their theology. In terms of worship, charismatic and experience focused worship methods uh, are more and more dominating what happens in evangelical and even in fundamental churches. In other words, you'll have churches that perhaps have a, a solid stated theology, both in their documents and in their preaching and teaching, but at some point they have chosen to adopt worship methods, practices that have come from a charismatic theological foundation, which is very different from ours. And those worship methods and practices will influence the theology of those churches to the point where they will find themselves drifting more and more towards charismatic theology. I think you can think of churches where this has happened. It doesn't mean that those churches will necessarily swing completely into charismatic practice, as in speaking in tongues and some of the other aberrant things that are a part of that kind of worship but they will move more and more towards that. And that's part of the reason why we have this kind of striking um, uh, anomaly uh, that at least is, is becoming more common in American evangelical churches, uh, churches that uh, even Calvinistic churches or non-Calvinistic but not charismatic who have decided that maybe, uh, the gifts didn't cease with the apostles and maybe there is still an opening for those kinds of things and it really leads them in some very surprising directions. So worship is one of those areas where our practice, if it is not founded in right theology, can ultimately lead our theology astray. Central focus of our existence is worship. When we look in the scriptures, we see that this is why we exist. Everything ultimately is about worship. In the book of Revelation, we see this emphasized wonderfully. For thou, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the 24 elders, the four and 20 elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. But that leads us then to the question of worship in the local church. Worship is important. What we do in worship must be based upon our theology, and we we're slowly building a theology of worship. What does worship look like in the New Testament? We need to get this right so that we are not ultimately led astray uh, in our theology in many, many areas. So what does worship look like in the local church? We could boil it down ultimately to one word, and this is where it's going to be a little bit surprising, but that word is edification. When Christians individually and corporately grow in Christ-likeness, then God is glorified. Remember, what is worship about? It is an action. It's the act of giving. It's the act of giving God the glory that he deserves. And the way I like to say it is this, the more beautiful the body, the more beautiful the head. 
Christ as the head of the church. Now, of course, we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is glorious completely, but God has ordained that we as a church, the universal church, the local church, especially in our, for the sake of our discussion, is the body, is the representation. The local church, in a sense, is the physical manifestation of Christ in this world. And the more beautiful, the more right, the more Christ-like a local church is, because its members are growing in Christ-likeness, the more glory the Lord Jesus Christ himself receives. Another way to say it is the more beautiful the bride, the more handsome the bridegroom. The more glorious the church, the more glorious her Lord. Think for a moment about the kind of person who would be worshiping God in the right way. It would have to be someone who knows God, obviously. Someone who's walking in fellowship with God. Somebody who is responding to God and to his word. It would, in the Old Testament, be a follower of the law. Somebody who was doing both the ceremonial and the uh, moral observances of the law. And in other words, true worship only comes from a true worshiper. And this is what we see even more clearly in the New Testament. God is glorified by having glorious followers. Christ is exalted when his churches are what they are supposed to be. We see this as we're thinking about the shift from the way worship was practiced in the Old Testament to the way it's practiced in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10.31. It's an echo of Psalm 29. Psalm 29, we read, Give unto the Lord the glory and strength. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. And Psalm, that was Psalm 30 and Psalm 96, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. The ultimate purpose of all creation ultimately is giving glory to God. Now this is leading up to what we're going to see ultimately in 1 Corinthians 14 and in the book of Ephesians. Now, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I want you to take note of the context here. It is in the desire to beautify others. 23 through 33 of 1 Corinthians 10 is all about Christians living and doing things in a way that is beneficial to fellow believers. A local church where all the members are seeking and striving for mutual edification and removing anything that hinders the lost from coming to Christ. When we talk about edification, we of course need to remember that edification begins with salvation. And this really is completely in line with what was going on in the Old Testament. Although Israel often missed it, Israel as a whole or in large parts of its population misunderstood what worship really was. They often acted as if the outward forms, the sacrifices, the temple practices, etc., were really enough. Just follow the right patterns, say the right words, do the right things, and de facto, God is worshipped. Ultimately, that's paganism. Just say the magic words, do the incantations, and God is happy, and he gives you what you want. And we sometimes are prone to the same mistake. We may be so careful about the outward forms or look of our worship 
that we may begin to think that if we just make our church services look and sound right, then God is happy. And again, as I mentioned in the introduction, Isaiah 29, which is quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 7, makes clear that that is not enough. The outward is not enough. We have to give God our hearts. And false worship uh, has a terrible effect. God's word is diminished in preaching, and man's ideas, man's ideas, and priorities are raised to the level of thus saith the Lord. That was the problem in Isaiah 29 that Isaiah was tackling. People were saying the words of priests, the words of the leaders were equal to God's word and ultimately that diminishes God's word. So, We'll skip this quick review right here because we've already talked about that. So let me just zap through these very quickly. They should be popping up on your screen. I think it's not staying up with me here. Let me exit out of that. And there we go. And we start that. And you can see some of the New Testament scriptures that I am placing here, and I think they're in your notes, uh, that reinforce what we have been talking about already. So let's jump now to some ideas from the book of Ephesians that relate completely to what we've been talking about. And I'm just going to give you a kind of a quick summary of some ideas. Some of these are, are things that I have studied, and some of these are uh, uh, truths and concepts that Dr. Mark Minnick, uh, longtime Bible teacher at BJU in the States and the pastor of Mount Calvary Baptist Church in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, shared at BGMBC in a conference a couple of years ago. And one of the things he emphasized in looking at the book of Ephesians is this idea, what God the Father is doing by Christ in the church for his glory forever. And what we see in the book of Ephesians, covering it very quickly, is that in the first half, the first three chapters, what God has made us individually uh, that it gives us a picture of what God has made us individually and as a church through salvation. So the first three chapters show us what we were and what we became. Beginning of chapter two has that wonderful statement, such were some of you after this list of terrible, ungodly living and sin. Such were some of you. And then salvation comes into picture. For by grace are you saved. It's a, a wonderful moment, a wonderful linchpin and transition. But then the second half of Ephesians goes on to talk about how God wants us to live, especially in our relationships with each other, with fellow Christians, and especially fellow Christians in our local church. And the goal individually and as a church is to become more like Christ so that the, so that the body of Christ is more fitting to its head. And when we do this, Christ gets the body he deserves, and the Holy Spirit gets the temple that he deserves. And the book of Ephesians has this very interesting statement about the angelic beings marveling, looking at what is going on with these imperfect creatures, who become more like Christ, and they marvel as they watch and they see this group of sinful people saved by the grace of God becoming more like Christ. And who gets glorified in that? Not the people, not the church, but Christ himself. And that's what we mean when we start to look at the idea of worship in the New Testament being primarily 
edification of the saints so that they become more like Christ. Because as you and I individually become more like Christ, our churches become a better picture of Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself gains the glory that he deserves. Now, very quickly, 1 Corinthians chapters 12 to 14 echo this concept from the book of Ephesians. Of course, chapter 12 is about the great diversity within the body of Christ. It's about the diversity of gifts, but there's one God and one body. And it's stated 15 times in that one chapter. All kinds of gifts, many kinds of people, different personalities, different strengths and weaknesses. But all of that, when it comes together, all of those people, when they come together and live the way they should, ultimately, it is pointing to the fact that there is one God. There really is uh, only one body, not multiple bodies. And then chapter 13, of course, speaks of love in the context of the local church as the key to this unity. In other words, the diversity, the differences that are described in chapter 12, which normally would cause a group of people to be scattered in many, many different directions, everybody pulling their own way, wanting to do their own thing. But when that group of people, born again, and motivated by a love that Christ puts in our hearts allows us to create and experience the unity that God desires. And then chapter 14 is a picture of how love creates one body. Love is what does it, but chapter 14 tells us how that happens, what love looks like in a local church, all gifts being used in corporate worship for the benefit of others. Now, again, I think that my the screen you're seeing is not staying up with me, so maybe I will just leave it like this for our uh, remaining minutes. And so chapter 14, as I mentioned, gifts being used in corporate worship for the benefit of others, others before self. And we read in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that all things be done unto edifying. And so what we're, what we're starting to see here, and that I'm going through very quickly, is that what we do, according to 1 Corinthians 14, in our local church, and especially in our public services, what we call our worship services, must be geared towards the edification of everybody else who is there because when we worship that way, when we do our public activities that way, when we function as a local church that way, God is ultimately glorified. Every part of the worship is to be this way. In chapter 14, verse 1, the prophesying or the preaching and teaching. In verse 3, speaking unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. In verse 4, it speaks of edifying the church. Again, in verse 5, that the church may receive the edification. In verse 26, let all things be done unto edifying. If we come into our local churches on Sunday morning with the goal primarily of what am I going to get out of it, then I'm missing the point. The point of my presence at that public worship, the point of my activity, what I do when I'm there, must be to build up my fellow believers. What good is the preaching or the teaching or the testimonies if they're done in a way that only benefits me as the speaker? What good is praying if I pray in a way that I'm the only one who can understand it? 
What good is singing or music if only the singer is getting something out of it or can participate in it? The Apostle Paul says no. He says, yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also. I'd rather do that than speak 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. This ultimately is worship, this attitude and this working out of this attitude, ministering with the utmost concern for the spiritual benefit of my fellow believers so that they individually and the whole church body mature unto godliness. And when this happens, there are amazing results. I'm not sure that I have a slide for this. All right, we do the results. In verse 16, people do understand. Let me just turn uh, there very quickly. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 16, notice the results of a group of believers where each one comes to the public church service with the desire to edify their fellow believers in whatever they are doing. In verse 16, they, when you bless, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. In other words, if we come in with this right attitude, then our fellow believers can say amen to what we're praising God about because they can understand. And in verse 17, if we're not careful to do these things, then they're not edified. But if we're careful about what we do in our church, doing all things for the edification of the saints, then our fellow believers ultimately are edified. So verses 16 and 17 speak about it in the negative, in the absence of doing what's right. But the implication there then is when we are coming to our public church services with this attitude, then these things happen. Our fellow believers all understand better God's word. Our fellow believers are able to give thanks to the Lord with us. Our fellow believers are edified. They can say amen. That means they are able to worship. And even the lost are pointed towards Christ. In verse 23 and verse 24, we have this amazing statement. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, perhaps immature believers, or unbelievers. Will they not say that ye are all mad? In other words, a church that is functioning where every uh, member is purely looking out for their own benefit, looking out for their own uh, growth, their own enjoyment, coming together in a worship service with the goal of merely their own self-benefit. An unbeliever looking at a church like that looks at him like, this is crazy. How come, why, why are they acting this way? Why are they, why is that person praying and nobody else can hear them or understand them? Why are, are they singing songs that nobody can understand? Why are they speaking uh, in a way that isn't helpful and isn't uh, teaching? And they look at that and they say, this is insane. But, Verse 24, if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, run learned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. And so there we have it, ultimately. What is worship in your local church in its public gatherings. Ultimately, what worship means is doing all things, preaching, praying, singing. Those are the things that the Apostle Paul mentions. 
testifying testimonies, all of those things being done in a way and with the desire to edify all the other believers who are there. Because when that happens, all those other believers are edified. They do understand. They can worship God better from their hearts. And others coming in and looking at this ultimately glorify God, even lost people. And so, although we tend to think about worship uh, in terms of music practices and uh, uh, ritual and all these other kinds of things that, that we think of as holdovers from the Old Testament, we think of worship uh, sometimes as performance as well, sometimes as experience. Ultimately, what we see emphasized in the New Testament is that worship takes place when Christians are being made more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in your handouts, I've given a bunch of information um, gleaned from a variety of sources about um, what some of those things look like, the kinds of things that can be a part of that. Uh, I will touch on some of those briefly next week. We're going to talk about some other uh, ideas from the New Testament next week, but I'll probably go through some of these. Um, but you've got that information there, and I'd encourage you to take a look at those things. And then there's a section that deals specifically with music. And I do want to note, as I prepare to end here and open up our time for questions, um, that the Apostle Paul includes music in 1 Corinthians 14 as a aspect of edification. And then he does the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, and even more clearly in Colossians 3. Now, music is not our primary topic uh, tonight or uh, in this series, but what we see is that music is a tool for edification, and therefore it becomes a tool for worship, because when music is used to help Christians become more like Christ, then God is glorified. Now, we can worship God, in a sense, directly with music. We can sing praises to him. And that is certainly a real and legitimate aspect of worship. But the emphasis in the epistles is primarily on the use of worship and preaching and praying as a means of each of us becoming more like Christ. Because ultimately, Christ gets the glory he deserves not so much by the beauty of our songs, but in the effect of those songs on making us more like Christ. Now, that does not mean that beauty is not important, but ultimately, the beauty that God desires is a life that is being conformed into his image. And ultimately, that's what worship is. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing there, and I will uh, stop now to take some time for some questions. Uh, I'll be glad to answer some questions. And then next week, I'm going to touch on a few other aspects of New Testament worship, and I'm gonna, I will talk more about some, uh, some of the details, some of the applications of that. But tonight, I wanted to make sure we were settled on on this particularly uh, New Testament focus on what worship is. So if anybody has any questions, Okay, I do see a question from uh, Joyce here. Paul said, forbid not to speak in tongues. Did he mean, let me turn, let me look at the verse there. Verse uh, 40. Right. Forbid not, verse 39, forbid not to speak with tongues. It's important 
uh, and this is going to be a, a larger uh, issue than we can I could get into uh, deeply here. But it's important to remember that in 1 Corinthians 14, when the Apostle Paul is speaking about tongues, he is speaking about uh, known or understood languages. He's, we're not talking about um, a charismatic idea of, um, of a heavenly tongue or angelic uh, languages or ecstatic speech uh, that nobody uh, understands. That's not what's being discussed in 1 Corinthians 14. It is actually tongues that people do understand. And so what we, we could say is something like this. If, uh, and Joyce, you experienced this. You came to the Philippines for a while. And when you visited a church where all of the preaching was in Tagalog, um, that was tough for you. You, I'm sure, did not get very much out of that preaching or that praying uh, if the singing was in Tagalog as well. It doesn't mean that it was wrong uh, for people to worship God in Tagalog. Um, the challenge was that you don't speak that language. And the Apostle Paul is not condemning the, the gift of tongues or the gift of being able to speak in languages, especially the, uh, this unusual gift during that time of being able to even speak in languages that a person had not studied, although that may or may not be what's going on right here. But the point is, what is the use of that? What's the use of exercising that particular gift in a situation where the people will not be edified by it? So what would that look like uh, today? Um, uh, in Singapore, you, you have to wrestle with this uh, uh, frequently uh, in your churches and the way you organize your churches. And so some churches uh, handle it by having an English language service and then having a Chinese language service and maybe a Tamil uh, language service. That's one way to handle that. Uh, there, the application is going to vary depending on the context and what the needs are of, of the church. Uh, so here in the Philippines, depends on if you're in Metro Manila or in the province, that was going to dictate the kind of language. Um, but each church is, is given the responsibility of doing everything they can to make sure that everybody is edified. So uh, the application of that is going to vary depending on the context. I have uh, a friend in the U.S. in the state of New Jersey who the Lord, uh, it's a primarily English language church, but the Lord has brought many uh, Latino people into that church who do not speak English. And so the way they've worked with this uh, uh, problem, a uh, challenge, really not a problem, but a challenge is that uh, a, an assistant pastor sits in a small room at the back of the church. And as the senior pastor is preaching, this assistant pastor is translating into a microphone and the, the, uh, Spanish-speaking brethren um, have little earphones, and they're listening, and they're in the worship service, but they're listening to the sermon in their own language. And when they sing, some people are singing out of an English language hymn book, and some people are singing out of a Spanish language hymn book, and everybody is being edified. For them, that's the answer that works to help them uh, worship God according to 1 Corinthians 14. So it's going to really uh, be based upon the context, uh, how one solves some of the challenges. Uh, but what the Apostle Paul does is point out what's important, what has to happen. And then there is a level of flexibility uh, for churches, depending upon their context and what the specific needs are. Uh, can I ask you about the uh, worship in synagogue and worship in the church? Um, what are the main difference or something that we that we, we, we learn from them? Or in those Old Testament time, did we uh, evolve the church service from the synagogue worship? Are there similarities or differences? 
Sure, it's a great question. Um, there has uh, been um, a, uh, a, a thought that the early church took its uh, practices primarily from synagogues uh, and then adapted them uh, for uh, the gathering of Christians. That may be true. Uh, the challenge uh, is that from, from my reading, and I've just been recently um, looking into that issue again, actually, just in the past couple months, uh, is that we don't have any clear descriptions or accounts of what synagogue worship was like until after um, Christianity was established. Uh, in, in other words, historical records and writings about what happened in synagogues. Uh, the, the records that uh, exist date from around 100 to 150 AD. That's the earliest. Uh, so we don't really, we may or may not, I should say, have an accurate picture of what synagogue worship looked like uh, when Christ was walking on the earth. Um, I would say that it is likely that some of the early church practices were drawing on practices of the synagogue, but we can't state it categorically. Uh, we, we don't have evidence in the scriptures to clearly uh, indicate that, and we don't have the historical evidence uh, to make a direct connection. But mm -hmm. uh, so we can't be too, I can't be categorical about it, but I would say uh, it is probable uh, that some of the practices would have been carried over. Um, that's a bit different than looking at what would be taken from Old Testament practices. The Old Testament practices were described for the temple, for this national uh, worship. And the synagogues were originally established um, in situations where there was no temple or it was impossible to get to the temple. Uh, and the, uh, from what I understand, uh, of those practices, they were not trying to replicate and could not replicate temple worship in each synagogue. So we have to be really careful about drawing direct lines uh, from the synagogue because we don't have a record of that and from uh, the temple worship. Uh, it's at least from what we see in the book of Acts and the epistles, there does not seem to be any attempt on the part of the early churches uh, to recreate temple worship in the local church. That doesn't mean that the temple worship is unimportant, and I, I plan to talk about that more uh, in the coming weeks and what we can learn and what we can take from that. But uh, in Paul's writings uh, and Peter, J John, uh, all of these who are primarily addressing local churches, uh, we don't have any instruction um, dictating that the practices of the temple should be uh, somehow replicated. And this is where uh, Roman Catholicism and other highly liturgical churches um, have a, uh, uh, a problem uh, because their, uh, their theology, their theological perspective about the Old Testament and those practices um, is uh, really not accurate. And so they end up uh, striving to recreate uh, temple priorities in uh, the local church. And we don't have any indication that uh, the early church ever did that. In fact, every indication we do have in the New Testament is that they did not. And that the, the focus uh, really became this idea of us individually and as a church being the temple. No longer is there a temple with its orchestra and its choir and its sacrifices. There is uh, a believer who is a temple. There is a local church, a body of a group of, of believers who are the temple. And therefore, as that temple 
becomes more like Christ. Uh, Christ is glorified. Okay. Um, I don't know, Brother Jacob, if you'd like me to continue. Joyce um, asked one other question here. I think I could address this um, uh, very briefly in 1 Corinthians uh, 14, verse 14. If I pray with an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What does that mean? And that's an excellent question. Um, some people will look at that and our charismatic brethren will look at that uh, and read into that the idea that we can pray and we don't understand what we're saying, but somehow we are praying, even though we don't understand what we're saying. And that's not what the Apostle Paul is indicating here. What he's saying here is that his understanding is unfruitful for his fellow believers. In other words, Paul could speak or pray in an unknown tongue, and he would be praying to God. My spirit prayeth. He would be honestly speaking to God, and he knows what he's saying to God as he's doing it. But the fact that he understands what he's saying is not benefiting the body. So if I were to begin speaking to you right now, or if I began to pray to God right now in German, the vast majority of people in our Zoom room right now uh, would not understand what I'm saying even though I would, I, of course, I, I'm actually not fluent in German. I know a little bit, but not too much. But assuming I did, uh, I would understand what I'm saying to God. But my understanding would be unfruitful for you. It wouldn't help you. You would not be able to say amen to what I am praying. So that's what's going on in verse 14 there, Joyce. I hope that